So thank you, Celeste. We appreciate Celeste heading this up and uh, every year being so diligent with it, uh, keeping us on track with when it's going to happen. Our kids are participating in this, uh, uh, youth church participating in this, so it's a great thing. And I think it's worth seeing the video just to see the, the look on the faces of the kids that are getting those things. And so um, it's an opportunity for us. So we praise God for the opportunity and pray that it's a great success. i um, going to ask the kids to come on up at this time. It is so good to see you guys this morning. Everybody is up early and here. I appreciate that. I, I want to um, offer you a couple of things this morning um, just as a, a way to say that, that I want to give you something. I'm reaching out. I want to just show you my love this morning. So I have a gift of love that I want to be able to give to you. Is anybody interested in that gift of love? If you are, please raise your hand. All right, Weston, I see that you're interested in it. So um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you this gift of love. All right. So with this, I'm going to ask you, um, anybody else interested in a gift of love? Anybody? All right. All right, Abby, let me give you, I've got another one right here. Abby, there you go. Now, with this gift of love, I'm going to ask you, now I've given this to you, but I'm going to ask you right now, are you interested in being able to turn this gift of love in for the possibility of maybe getting three more gifts of love. If you are, then raise your hand. Oh, we've got people raising their hand that didn't even get the first gift, right? So you are, so let's turn yours in. Now, what is it you're doing? You're turning this in for the possibility of what? Getting three more? Three more what? Three more packs of gummies? Well, let's see. I know you keep looking at that little yellow thing on the back of these gummies. Did you wonder what that was? Huh? Yeah, I did. You did? Okay. But Abby, you didn't turn your gift of love in. You didn't, you weren't interested in getting three more, right? Okay. So let me read what's on the back of this. And Abby, you can read what's on the back of yours. Let's see what it says. It says... That with this, what does yours say, Abby? Oh, I wrote that, so you want me to read it? Okay. Yeah. It says, receive three more packs of gummies. So, you already had something that said you were going to get three more packs, right? So, do you want three more packs? It comes with yours, right? Here you go. There's one, there's two, there's three. That was a pretty good gift of love, wasn't it? Are you glad you're held on to it? Okay, Weston, what about you? How are you feeling about it right now? Do you wish you would have kept yours so that you could get three more? You turned yours in, but when you turned it in, I told you it was for the possibility of getting three more. And you did have the possibility of getting three more, but I never planned on giving you three more for turning it in. There used to be a show on TV called Let's Make a Deal. Have you ever seen that show? Huh? Well, what you just made was a bad deal. You, you turn this in when you already had one for the possibility of getting three more, right? So, how'd that work for you? Not too good, right? Okay, so, because of that, how many do you have right now, Weston? Huh? How many do you have? Look at your hand, open your hands and see how many packs of gummies you have. Zero. Zero, right. So how many does Abby have? Four, right? Okay, so listen. How many? Four? Okay, so here's what I want to tell you. Weston did the same thing that all of us do. You know, we all have something and we don't really realize what we have. We always are concerned with what we want. And what do we always want? Money. We always want more, right? 
always want more, whether it's gummies or when you get older, it's going to be money or it's going to be things or it's going to be just different times that you want to go somewhere or do something. We always want more. But it's like we're never, we're never content. And content means that you're satisfied. We're never satisfied with what we have if we think that we can get more, right? So here's what I want to tell you today. As you get older, this same thing is always going to be playing in your mind. You're always going to want more of something. And the only thing that you ever should want more of is more of your relationship with the Lord. You see, the only way that you're ever going to be completely happy is to have Him. And if, if you get Him, if you accept Jesus as your Savior, do you realize that He keeps giving you? It's like if you accept Jesus with your Savior, one of these notes come with it that say, I'm going to keep blessing you. You're always going to have this joy. You're always going to have this peace, even when hard times come. But if you don't accept Jesus, or you just continue to go through this life saying, well, I want more of that, and I want more of that, you'll never be happy. I want you to, to see it's not just me saying it. Is there any adults out there today that have looked over what you had and put all your attention into trying to get more of something that you want and it hasn't turned out right? If that's happened to anybody, any adult, would you please stand up? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Look at them. Look how many people that's happened to. So here, I want you to to know that we're supposed to be content with what we have with God. What does God give us? Somebody tell me what God gives us. What does He give us, Olivia? He gives us trust. Yep, yep. He gives us somebody to trust. He gives us a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. He gives us everything. He lets us speak. He lets us breathe. He lets us be able to see that He's never going to leave us. He's never going to turn us away. He's never going to forsake us. So when you accept the gift of God, just like this pack of gummies, it comes with all these things. Don't... Get older in life and give it up for all these other things you think you want. Okay? So let's pray. Father God, I love you. I praise you and I thank you for these children. I pray, God, that they can see the adults. And Lord, where we went wrong in trying to go after the things in life that we want that have nothing to do with you. I pray, God, that they would see the example. And Lord, that they would grow and be close to you and stay close to you and be content with just having you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Looks like I'm going to have to open a new box. Okay. Let me empty this box first, okay? Now you're going to get one. There you go. You're welcome. 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 You're very welcome. You're welcome. If you have your Bible, please stand up and raise it above your head. Bear witness of his word this morning. Beautiful, beautiful. You may be seated. You know, we're always trying to lay the groundwork with the children's sermon, right? How many of us have been this child before who was so focused on what we wanted that we didn't realize what we had? We lived in a state of discontent. We lived in a state of anxiousness, a state of disappointment, because we weren't focusing on what we had as much as we were what we wanted. And so I want to talk about this today as far as asking these two questions, what do you want and what do you have, in hopes that we can be able to get the perspective that God wants us to have in hopes that it'll change lives today, in hopes that we'll be able to see ourselves today. I, I knew that I was overwhelmingly led to this as I started to look at it a couple of weeks ago. I realized this is something that we struggle with a great bit, especially Christians. It is one thing to know that 
you have come to God and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've received the greatest gift ever, just like uh, they were talking about with the shoe boxes, the book about the greatest gift you've received. Anybody here receive the greatest gift? But then in receiving that greatest gift, it has been put somewhere and put aside somewhere at different times because we've wanted all these different things. We weren't content in what we had. And our life began to just be filled with dissatisfaction about what we wanted. And so Paul addresses this in the book of Philippians chapter 4. So if you'll turn to Philippians chapter 4, I want to read to you what Paul says. I want to read to you verse 11 through 13, but I want to I want to put this in the context for you, if I can. I want you to understand that when Paul wrote these letters, he wrote them from a prison cell, from a dirty prison cell, realizing that with the abuse and with the loneliness and with the destitute situations that were there, it would be a place to where the one thing that you wanted in your mind the most was just to get out. But in this, Paul wrote these remarkable letters. And you would look at his condition and you would say, there is no way that he could be happy in that situation. And Paul wrote this in verses 11 through 13. He said, not that I speak in respect of want, but I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be what? Tell me again. Content. I know both how to be abased, that means in need, and I know how to be abound, that means having plenty. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then he says, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. And a lot of people don't realize this verse comes in context of the preceding verses. What he's trying to say is that no matter what situation that I'm in, whether it's a situation of earthly need, whether everything is, is seemingly uh, not going according to my plan, I've learned how to be content because I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. He's got that one determining factor in his life. Or whether he's in a position to where he has a lot of things going his way, he's learned to be content in that situation also. He goes down to verse 19 and he says, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. So he is basically stating in this canon of verses here that, that because he has a relationship with God Almighty, Yahweh, the one and only true living God, because he has a, a relationship with his maker, with the God that loved him, that saved him, because he had that, that relationship, he can do all things. He doesn't have to be in a state of discouragement or disappointment even when he's in a state of need. Now, I think it's key, verse 11. He said three words. Paul said, I have learned. The reason that I'm pointing these three words out is because it's not something that comes natural. Contentment is not something that comes natural to your and my natural flesh. It's a learned behavior. He said, I've learned. Do you know how most people learn? Most people learn contentment with what they have by being in a position where they not only do not get their wants, they lose what they had originally. The fear of losing what you have in some way makes what you had an area to where you were so content in. Can I get a witness? Anybody ever been there? So, I ask you these two questions today. What do you want? What do you have? The first question is not a question that we have to think too deeply about because it's a question that seems to stay on the front of our minds. You will see in this upcoming Christmas season that 
When you ask that child, what do they want for Christmas? It won't take them long to be able to, to state out this list. They have it in their mind. We don't have to think too long about what we want, do we? No one has to remind us to focus on what we want. I don't have to ask you today, hey, think hard about what you want. We know what we want. Uh, we have an idea because it's, it's in the front of our mind. It seems as if we're always focused on what we want, from what kind of food we want to how we want a certain situation to work out to how we want others to act to how we want others to think about us and see us. And of course, this includes material possessions that we want. We want, we want, we want, don't we? What we want leaves us open to a great deal of disappointment. I want you to understand that the greater amount of things that you want, the greater amount of disappointment you leave yourself open to. Disappointment never comes unless there's an unfulfilled want. For example, you may have wanted your morning to go differently today as you got ready to come to church. I want to see if anybody's with me so far. Anybody want something to go different up to this point this morning? Maybe it didn't go right at home as you were getting ready. You may have wanted something different to wear. You may have wanted a better or a different vehicle to drive to church. You may have wanted the light to turn green instead of stay red so long. You see, we're filled with little wants, right? Or you may have wanted the car in front of you to, to drive a little bit better <laughs> or faster or whatever. That, that was part of your wants. Or you may have wanted a better parking place when you got here at church. and You may have wanted to sit in a different place here at church. and You may have wanted to sing a different song this morning at church and then right now you may be wanting to get finished with this service at a certain time <laughs> because there's something that you want to do or somewhere that you want to go after we're done our whole morning thus far is driven by wants and at any given time, those wants may not be met and dissatisfaction comes in. Those are wants that you've dealt with just up to this point of your day, knowing that at any moment, this day cannot go the way that you want. and You'll begin to be discontent or unhappy. And I see so many people living in a state of discontentment. Christian, when you live in a state of discontentment, I have to explain to you that your light is not shining. Nobody wants what you have. So I would ask you this morning, has this already happened to anybody so far today? Some of these things uh, that I've mentioned, if it has, raise your hand. You see, this is what happens when we're continually focused on what we want. Now, the next question, what do you have? So consider this. The fact that you have a mind to understand the questions that I'm asking this morning, do you understand that that is a praise? Amen. In meeting this week, brokenhearted with people who couldn't have understood what I said, understand it is a praise. The fact that you have the health to be here this morning is a praise. Amen. The fact that you have some kind of transportation to get here, no matter what it is or what it was, is a praise. The fact that we have an ability to meet in a building this morning in a place uh, that is covered, that has the heat on, a place to sit down is a praise. Amen. The fact that we have the freedom to publicly meet to worship is a praise. Amen. The fact that we have music even playing this morning and a reason to sing is a praise. The fact that we get to hear the word of God preached and have the opportunity to hear him speak to our heart is a praise. The fact that we have God that loves us, that wants us to be here in his presence is a praise. And the fact that we have a way to come to God Almighty through his son Jesus Christ is a praise. The fact that he saw fit to sacrifice his son for somebody that would turn their back on him and he would have to keep issuing grace is a praise. In the midst of all those things that we want, 
in our time of discouragement or disappointment, even up to the day, even if it was a little disappointment or it was something that made us unhappy, did we remember what we had? These are things we have as opposed to things we want. I know so many times we have lots of prayer requests. I want you to realize our wants are the basis of our prayer request. But what we have is the basis of our praise. There's a difference between prayer request and praise. And when you're praising God, you're not wanting much because you're focused on what you have. Nothing wrong with a prayer request, but understand the praise is when your mind is focused on what you have. And this may seem elementary to you, but God saw this as so important because he knew that we're driven by our desire to be content. And he also knows that if we're counting on all of our wants to actually happen, then we're never going to be content. It all has to do with realizing what we want and what we have. The writer of Hebrews speaks to this. So I would ask you to turn to Hebrews chapter 13. It won't be far from where you're at now. In the instructions given here in Hebrews 13, verse 1 through 6, we get to verse 5 and 6, and we have a direct command. It says, let your conversation, this, is, this means your life, the way you live your life, your everyday life, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Such things as you what? For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So today I want us to, to be able to look at what we want and what we have by using these two words here, I want us to look at these two words in the Bible that shows us in detail these two words, covetousness and contentment. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content. The first, the first condition is a condition of covetousness. The second condition is a condition of contentment. We're warned not to live in a condition of covetousness. This is how important it is. If you choose to live your life in the wrong condition, the condition of covetousness, then your life will be unfulfilled, filled with discouragement, filled with unsatisfaction. You have a lack of true happiness and joy. And if you do experience it, it will only last for a little while. If you choose to live your life in the right condition, a condition of contentment, then you'll be able to have happiness, joy, peace on a daily basis, not just when everyone expects you to. You say, well, I'm trying to live a contented life is just things keep going wrong. What we're told by Paul and what we're told by the writer of Hebrews is the key to understanding this. You see, he gives a passage of scripture at the end that says, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. That is the key to our contentment. You don't have to try. God has made a way for you to be content. All you have to do is accept. You see, when you think about these big words, covetousness, it means a condition of coveting, of course, to want something more or different than what you have. And you can see, even as children are programmed by our natural mind, the option to get more would make us not as appreciative and clingy to what we have, right? Right? And it's not just the children. It only grows to a higher level as we get older. In definition, it's a strong desire after the possession of worldly things to wish to have one more than one possesses at the moment. And contentment on the opposite means a condition of being free from care because of satisfaction with what's already one's own. Hebrew word contentment or content is pleased in saying all this, understand that when we live in a state of want, we're living in a state of covetousness. But when we live our lives focused on what we have, 
we can live with a state of contentment. The Bible tells us that contentment comes when we realize who we are in Christ. When we realize that we have a relationship with God and that He'll always be with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And that's the only available through His grace. He's given us an opportunity of forgiveness of our sins and a relationship with Him. If you have a relationship with God, you can be content no matter what situation you're in. And you say, well, how do we get that from these verses? Well, understand in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews refers back to the book of Deuteronomy in this statement where he says, for it has been said, or for it is written, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This was something that God told the children of Israel as a way to prepare them for this thing that was going to happen in their mind. What was going to happen in their mind? The same thing that happens to ours. As they were going into the promised land, and you talk about Deuteronomy, you know, Moses was getting ready to, to die. Joshua was going to take over. They were going to go into the promised land, and they were going to receive all of these blessings. They had been in the wilderness for 40 years. They had struggled. They had seen their wrong, but now they were getting ready to go in it. They were going to cross Jordan, and he was saying, if you go here, even though it is a place where you think you're going to get what you want, it's a land filled with milk and honey. It's a land that is filled with fruit and vineyards that have already been planted, and I'm giving it to you. But even in giving it to you, you're going to want more. You're going to forget that I gave it to you. You're going to forget that your true happiness comes from me. You've been in the desert for 40 years. I've given you manna. I've taken care of you. I've given you water. I've given you uh, the powers that you see to deliver you from all of your enemies. But you're going to forget that because there's something so strong in your mind and it is your sense of want. And so we need to address it. You see a room full of people in here this morning? You know the difference between last week and this week was that want was played out this way this week. You wanted to be here. You say, well, you don't understand. I had other things that I have to. That happens occasionally, and that's understandable, and don't pick the sermon apart. The fact that you're here one time in the last four or five is a position of want. The fact that it's a continual thing, it's a position of want. No matter how you look at it. And I can tell you that I get to see this firsthand. I've seen it in my life a lot of times. But I get to see it firsthand. There's never a person that sits in front of me when we go through a counseling and they are at the bottom. There's never a person that you can't put into this category. Their disappointment comes from what? They don't have that they want. There's never been a person that has sat in front of me that has said, I want this relationship that I have with somebody to end. Unless there was something in that relationship that had to do with want. It was not a matter of them looking at what they had. It was a position of want. There's never been someone who has slipped into a, day, a state of discouragement or, or just depression about uh, what they, they have or the direction they're going that wasn't based on want. And do you know when want is fulfilled the most? This, would, this will shock you. It's when you have the most. It's when you have the most. You see, when a person gets to a position of want, because they see they don't have anything, that person is considering what they have. That person is saying, I have messed up going after what I want. I didn't realize what I had. And now God, now God, I only have you. From that point, you can start. From the position of want more, you can't start. You see, want and have are two different things, and he knew this is what was going to happen to the children of Israel. So I want you to flip back, because there's a great lesson here, and I'm not going to give the complete Bible study, but I want you to see why this verse is based on, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So go back to Deuteronomy chapter 31, please. 
And while you're doing it, I'll quote Hebrews 3 again, verse 5 and 6. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, you can be content because of this passage of Scripture, this promise of God that comes from Deuteronomy 31. You can base it all on that. And Paul was saying in his prison cell, I have learned to be content. Paul didn't have food. He didn't have luxuries. He didn't have uh, what you would say a, a good day going on. The rats were nibbling on him. He had been beaten. He had been scourged. He was changed in a filthy prison with excrement flowing all around him. And he said, I'm content. Why? Because he was going back to Deuteronomy 31 in his mind, the same principle. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 36, you will see. It says, as a command, as Joshua was going to succeed Moses, it says, be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. God promised the children of Israel that he would not leave them or forsake them. And in order for you to understand this, you would need to read these chapters around verse 31. And I'm going to give you an oversight briefly. I don't want to lose you on this fact, but these, these are the jewels that are here. So listen. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, as they were getting ready to go into the promised land, God gave them a choice. The children of Israel, His chosen people, the people that He made a covenant with, this is important. He gave them a choice to obey Him and follow after Him and enjoy their life, being content and knowing that if they choose to want their relationship with Him to be a priority, and if they choose to be focused on, on what they had with God, then He would continue to bless them. Amen. But if they chose to want other things more than God, then they would lose their contentment and they would live in a continual state of want, never being satisfied and never being content. Now, to the Christian today, I want to tell you, once you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have everything. The reason that he puts such importance on not putting anything in front of him is because anything that you put in front of him shows him that you have a greater want than him. And he can fulfill all of your needs and he knows it. So we can't even begin to count the verses that talk about us prioritizing our relationship with him. And prioritizing is not being able to give him what time that's not planned on some hobby. Well, I would go today, but I've got to do this. Or I would go today, but we've got this going on here. Or I would do this today, but I've got this. Or I would read today, but I've got this going on. Or I would do this, but I've got this, and I've got this, and I've got this. That's not a place of priority. When you find yourself actually giving the excuse and believing the excuse, you're in trouble. Because you've already convinced yourself and you've had counsel with the worst person that you can have counsel, which is yourself. You say, how do you know? Been there, done that? Have to watch out for that guy. He tends to agree with whatever I think. And he helps me come up with reasons, right? In Deuteronomy 30, it was put to them, you can receive a blessing or a curse. You can choose to put me as a priority and be taken care of for the rest of your life. I've already laid it out in front of you. It sounds a little bit like us. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, God said, I've made a way. I've prepared a life for you, a life that brings you into fellowship with me. You're a sinner, and so you've got a problem in coming to me, God says. But I'm going to make a way in spite of what you've done or what you're planning to do or any time you're going to fail, I'm going to make a way. I'm going to give you my sinless son. 
He's going to sacrifice his life on the cross so that you can claim it and believe it and you can accept Jesus as your Savior and you can come to me. Once you do that, then you have to understand the God of creation, the God that provides, the God that sustains, the God that can create and sustain the whole world that can make anything happen, the God that keeps you breathing, that keeps you thinking, is going to have you because you're his child. And if you're his child, he's making you the promise that the most loving father would make, which says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And there's nothing in this world that you own right now that you can say that promise comes with. No possession, no amount of life, no relationship. That's why Jesus in Matthew 6 says, Lay not up for yourself treasures in, on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt and thieves do not break through and steal. What is he saying? Everything you have has an area of depreciation or an area where it goes away. Even our relationships that we have here on this earth, they don't stay here forever. The focus should be on transcending that relationship from here to heaven. And God's made a way for that. So he says, in this package of relationship that I've given you, here's a sure promise. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Who knew that? Oh, great people of the Bible. Paul said on the prison floor, I've learned how to be content. David said at his lowest, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Listen, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. I'm never going to be afraid because you're with me. And that's what he's telling them. You say, well, man, that must have been a good speech. Man, it must have worked. Well, listen, if you go to the 32nd chapter, even the, the end of the 31st chapter, you're going to see that God pulled Moses and he said, Moses, listen, this is my heart. I want to explain this to you. I know these people and I know they're full, full of want. I'm going to set them up. I'm going to put them in a place to where they have everything to eat, everything. But these people aren't going to realize what they have. They're going to be ungrateful. All they're going to be geared to is what they want. So Moses, for the sake of the next generation, I want you to come up with this song. You said, a song? I've never heard that. Well, yeah, verse chapter 32 in Deuteronomy is all about Moses' song. So what is it? What is it? Well, it's a song that he told him to, to teach so that everybody would learn it. What is it a song about? about the Lord, and read it sometime. It's a song about the Lord delivering, what he had done for them, where he'd taken them from, where he was taking them to, the promises of companionship, and the penalty if they turned against him. He said, teach this song to them. Why? Well, I know what's going to happen. You say, well, it was God's will. No, God's will doesn't mean that's what he, uh, knowing that it was God, his, his sovereign will doesn't mean God wanted it to happen. God's sovereign, so he just knows what's going to happen. You understand that, right? He said, I know what's going to happen. They're going to get to this land flowing of milk and honey. They're going to get what they've wanted for 40 years. They're going to get it even better. And they're not going to realize what they have. What does he say is going to happen? Well, in chapter 31, if you were to go down towards the end of the chapter, in verses 16 through 20, he said, here's what's going to happen to them. You say, well, yeah, those people. No, hey, listen, those stories are not for those people. It's for those people and us people. Right. It's because those people are like us people. You say, no, they were God's chosen people. Listen, if you've accepted the covenant through Jesus Christ, you're in a covenant relationship with God Almighty. He writes this story for me and you to look at ourselves today. He said in verse 16 through 20, he said, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. And the people will rise up, listen to this phrase, and they will go a-whoring after the gods of strangers in a land where they go to be among them. He said, I can't believe we're saying that in church. Hey, I'm reading the Bible. He puts it just as plain. You know what he's saying? You're going to commit adultery on me. You're going to leave your relationship with me, and you're going to go a-whoring after other gods. What does that mean? That means that you're going to make your priority for somebody else besides me. You're going to leave the love relationship you have with me to go get something that you want. Is that pretty clear? 
He goes on to say, My anger shall be kindled, verse 17, against them in that day. I'll forsake them. I'll hide my face from them. Meaning that they're going to cry out for what, what they want. But I'm not going to hear them. It says now, verse 19, write this song for you and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths and this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto them that floweth with milk and honey, they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat. Then will they turn to other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them, this song shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of their mouths of their seed. For I know their imaginations which they go about even now before I have brought them into the land which I swear to them. He goes on to say in verse 23, and he gave Joshua the son of Nun, charge and said, Be strong and of good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. You know, even in Joshua's command, he gives them one thing. You'll have me. You'll have me. Say it with me. You'll have me. Say it again. Again. One more time. That's what he told Joshua. Everything was based on, no matter what you face, you'll have me. We don't see in God's word where Joshua stepped out of the will of God in such a way to where with the adversities that he faced, you would have seen there's a lot of times. But Joshua, Joshua is unique in this fact that he was told this so many times. It was like a, a reoccurring charge to him. You'll have me. I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. You'll have me. I pick up on this charge as something that we need to live by. I look at Hebrews 13 and see that we're told not to live in a state of covetousness, but with a state of contentment. Why? Because he had said, I will never leave thee. You get this, right? Like, it's the key. And he goes back and he says, go back and read this story, and you will see the reason people leave fellowship with me is because they forget that I am what they have. You see, there's such gravity to knowing we have a relationship with God. And what happens to us is the same thing that happens to this kid, th these kids. We lose it in the moment in life. Something passes our eye, passes our mind's eye that we think we want, and we put it in front of God all the time. We can put it in front of prayer life. We can put it in front of, uh, of studying his word. We can put it in front of singing his praise. We can put it in front of, of being here and coming together and assembling in worship, which he's told us to do. How many times can we do that when something comes there that we think we want? And we think, God, we think we're doing God a favor just to every now and then show up or claim his name or say something strong about God in public. But would people know the joy that we have about what we have? Or would they see the discontent that we're walking around with about what we want? There's a sense of ungratefulness that's within us that's only realized when we get to a state of losing what it is that we're not considering that we have. And it doesn't just have to be relationship. It could be possessions. It could be something that somebody is doing for you. It could be a, an act of love that somebody is displaying towards you and we take it for granted and we take it for granted we take it for granted always wanting something else or thinking that we've got a better plan. But I want you to understand this song of Moses was put in place to constantly remind them that if they had God, they had everything and they could be content. Now, I want you to understand, unfortunately, we don't begin to realize through our natural self what we have until we chase after what we want and lose the security of what we have. We find that in so many instances. So I want you to take a good look at the way that that our natural mind leads us. I want you to take a look at our plan. I thought it would be good just to Put it down and see if maybe this applies to you. I know it did me. Most all of us would say that, that we would love to be content. 
We would say that we're working and we're planning and we're struggling right now in life because I'm wanting to reach that point in life where I am content and satisfied and have no worries. Is everybody on that plan today, right? That's why my life is so hard right now because I'm, I'm trying to reach that point of contentment, that condition of being content. So let's take a good look at this plan. Let's step out of our n normal way of thinking and really look at our plan. What we're saying, in essence, is that we are willing to give up being satisfied right now, and we're agreeing to live a life of working out our plan that says that when we reach a certain point of having what we think we want, then we're not going to be willing to stop, that we're going to be willing to stop and say, I am now content. Our plan says right now, this one that's going in our mind, if this can just happen, I'm going to say I'm content, right? It's like we think we're going to reach this place that says, okay, I've got it. You realize the, the wisest man in the world, who is the richest man in the world, his name was Solomon. He wrote the book of Proverbs. You know what he said? A man that has silver is never satisfied with silver. That would be somebody that knew. Like he doesn't have a point that says, I don't want anymore. No, his want drives him. Now, we begin to say, when we get in that position of being fat, you say, oh, are you talking about us being fat? Yes. The way Moses was. He said, when you get to that promised land and you're waxing fat, what does that mean? That means you're full. That means everything is good. You're eating off the land. You never thought you'd make this. You never thought you'd drive this. You never thought you'd have this. When you're waxing fat, guess what you'll turn to? Well, how am I going to use this? Yeah, I'm blessed and I have kids, so what can I do with them? Where can I take them? Well, be careful where you take them when you should have them in the presence of God. Because you've waxed in fat that you had children, so now you're wanting other things for them. Oh, you're crying out to God to get them and crying out to God to keep them safe, but now that you have them, you're going other places. You cried out to God to have that relationship, and then when you got that relationship and everything was going good, you're waxing fat in that relationship. You begin to say, well, I've got this and I've got that, and you begin to want other things. God gave you these possessions that you have and you got wax and fat in them it always bothers me when somebody comes and says hey listen i've got this new job and the only thing bad about it is i'm not going to be able to be here at church or, i've got this new thing that's going to take me away from this or hey listen the lord has blessed me and i've got a boat you say oh you're preaching against boats no i'm preaching about worshiping boats when you should be worshiping god I'm preaching about worshiping things and places when you need to be worshiping God. You say, oh, well, you're just making it worse and worse on yourself. Listen, I've prayed that God would give me words. Get mad at Him. I'm accountable to Him. I'm saying we all do it and it's based on what we want and we justify it with a reason and we come back and say, well, hey, listen, God wants me to have this time off. God doesn't want you to have time off from him. Get that lie out of your mind. He wants you to have time off from life and enjoy yourself and relax, but he doesn't want you to have time off from him. You see, in this plan that we have, when will we be content? Will it be when we have a certain amount of money? Will it be when we have a certain amount of things? Will it happen when we have that perfect wife or husband? Will it happen when we reach certain goals for ourselves? You see, the flaw in this plan is that we don't have a plan that we know will give us happiness and contentment at a point to where we can stop. Did you hear what I'm saying? We don't have a plan that gives us a place to stop. We're no different. We have, when you look at these children, you see our actual mentality that we have. We're just adult children with natural desires to want and want more. And usually the things that disappoint us are the things that go against what we want, even if it goes against our schedule. You know, we can lose our joy in a day because something has interrupted our schedule or interrupted our life. When it's actually an opportunity to be able to trust God through it. 
And we can actually be discouraged about it because it's going gonna, it's gonna to take more time out of our life or it's going to inconvenience our life. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy, and you can read this sometimes, verse 6 and 7. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. One of the greatest short verses in the Bible. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Not just contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment. That means you're living after God. You have a relationship with God. You're living according to His Word with contentment, knowing that He is all you need is great gain. But He doesn't stop there. He drives it on home and He says, in case you forgot, Verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we shall carry nothing out. You know, Job made that statement too, the book of Job, you'll read it. He got to a position to where his sin was, and we always think, oh, he didn't have anything. His sin was he took a lot of pride in what he had, but he still wanted more. He wanted to have the praise of people. He wanted this, but when he lost it, Then he began to focus on what he really had. He had a relationship with God. Amy, when that baby came into the world last Sunday evening, you were there, right? That baby came in this world how? Naked. Just naked. Without a thing. That's the shell that baby came in. That baby lives to be 90 years old and the Lord doesn't come back. That baby will leave this world that same way. And that's that's what Paul is saying. Hey, don't... Let your mind go wrong here. There won't be a hearse following you, a, a, a U-Haul following your hearse. So what do you have? Well, you don't have anything that you're going to carry externally to heaven. What you have is internally. God said, I want you to know that I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, and that you can do all things through me because I strengthen you, and that I am God and I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory, meaning I have everything. Why are you wanting it from the rest of the world? Are you not satisfied with me? And when God is able to answer that question for us and he is able to say, it doesn't look like Mike is satisfied with me, then I can guarantee you a father that loves me is not only going to make sure that I don't get what I want, he's going to put me to a place where I have to look at what I have. Now, I don't want any of us to get to that point today. You said it doesn't sound like it. No, that's why I'm preaching this message. You realize if we realize it today and we bow before a holy and righteous God and get on our knees today before we get to a place of being destitute, before we lose what we, we didn't realize we had, that closeness or whatever it is in life that you're wanting more of, before we lose that and before we lose that, that fellowship with God where he's saying, you're crying out to me, but I'll hide my face from you until you realize what you had with me. Before you get to that point, listen to his word today. He said, oh, somebody has to get to that point. Why do you think he had Moses write that song? He says, so that your seed, your generations will know before they get to this point not to leave me because I'm not going to leave them. Everybody in here this morning can admit that this happens to us, right? We get geared to our want and we forget what we have. I'm convinced until we can learn to be content, we'll never reach the effectiveness that God wants us to reach. When we, when we covet, we display selfishness. We display dissatisfaction with what, what God's given us. You say, well, that means that you're just supposed to sit there and not want anything in life. No, God wants us to have drive. He wants us to be able to, to pursue things, but he doesn't want us to put it in front of him. And the things that he does give us, He doesn't want us to push those aside and say, I want more, I want more, I want more. Because he's the one that gives them. Now, I want to ask you two questions here to close. First of all, do you have a relationship with God? Do you? 
Not that you know God, not that you know and believe God, but you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You know, you can't have a relationship with God until you come to Him through Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. You're not in a relationship with God because you're at church today. You're not in a relationship with God because you were born into a family that went to church. You're not in a relationship with God because you believe that Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago. You're in a relationship with God because you've accepted that He died on a cross as a sacrifice for your sins, and you've prayed to God in a verbal prayer that says, God, I'm a sinner and I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, that is when you will find contentment because at that point, you will be connected to the God of all creation that loves you, that made a way for you to get to Him. Until then, you will chase life and you will never truly be content. Amen. Your true contentment is found in God. Right. Why? He is the only thing that will never leave you or forsake you. Amen. And he appeals to you today. Jesus continued to say, come, come to me, come to me. And maybe you've come to him and accepted the Lord as your savior, but you're living in this same world that everybody else is. This same world that appeals to our eye, right? Right? Commercials on TV. Boy, what is it? Let's get my mind here. Let's get my mind here. Let's get my mind. Here. Oh, I was living right, and hey, I'm doing this, and all of a sudden I see this commercial. These people are on the beach, and here's what they're doing. And look, hey, they're carrying a cooler down there, and they're having the best time in the world. And before, hey, look at this, and man, they're having fun. I wish I was there. I wish I was doing this. And what happens? Want, 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 and you don't think about, hey, look what I have. Those people are actors. And I'm counseling them when their life falls apart because they're making unsober decisions. You get what I'm saying? How naive are we? What do you have? Do you have him? If you're a child of God and you have him, praise him. Amen. Rejoice in him. Realize that if you take your last breath today, God grabs your hand and says, I've got you forever. And if you don't take your last breath today, he said, I'll walk with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And the problem that you get in tomorrow, you won't be in by yourself. And I'll bless you in ways. I'll make things happen in your life where you'll see me. Just don't forget me. Don't forget what you have in this quest for what you want. The world's doing that. If you've accepted me as the one and only true living God and you've come to me, by all means, don't keep wanting something besides me or I'll think you never did want me. Does God know you want him? You see, that's the only thing that we can just be covetous about is a deeper relationship with God. Does he know you want him? Are you resting in the fact of what you have? Or does he just see you wanting everything else in the world? And listen, you can look back at your week and you say, I was disappointed about this. I gave you just a glimpse of two hours of a daytime and you can see all the areas of want. Where are you at? Look this morning at, at what you have and look at what you want. Let the scriptures answer the question for you and come and talk to Father God this morning. Come and use this time and talk to Father God. You'll finish that prayer and that conversation with peace this morning. Amen. You don't need to get to a point of where you're crying out and have nothing. That's why he gave that song and he sings that song to you this morning. You say, what was that song? I just gave it to you in a message. That's God's song. Did you hear it this morning? So, if you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ... He wants you today. He wants to give you contentment. He wants to show you that you can have everything if you have him. Amen. If you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to fall in front of a holy and righteous God and praise him for what he's given us. Repent to him for our mindset because he knows it already. He knows that we've left him at certain times for what we want. We've walked away from him. You can make it right this morning. 
And you say, well, if I'm right where I need to be, glory to God, then you need to be the first one praising him this morning. Stand with me, please. Father God, sometimes we fail to see what we have because our mind just stays focused on what we want. Lord, I know you've taught this to me. and Lord, forgive me when I don't realize what I have with you. You've taught it to your children this morning, so Lord, I can't pray for them. I can just pray on their behalf. Listen to their prayers this morning as they come and bow before you. And Lord, for everyone here listening today that has never accepted your gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, Lord, but they can see right now that this life is giving them, Lord, just a state of discontentment. They keep wanting and wanting, but they've never received the salvation you've offered. I pray, God, today they would see their need right now to cry out and ask for that salvation. Lord, speak to their heart. Let them know contentment comes when they come into a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to sing.